Hello, welcome to the Phys Ed Summit. Uh, my name is Adam Howell, and I am your moderator for today's session. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this global event. We could not make this day happen without you. We're very humbled by the support of the summit from each of you and the Phys Ed community as a whole. By sharing what you will learn today with one person, you are able to impact hundreds of students. Thank you so much for being here to push best practices, effective health and physical education professional development forward. Reminder that if for some reason the video feed stops, please check out the Tazel for a new video link. It may take us a few minutes to get it started and rolling again, but we thank you for your patience. As you know, technology is never 100% perfect. A uh, reminder about the badge system. We are doing digital badges this year for the Phys Ed Summit. I will post a link in the Tazel for information on the badges, and I got to catch them all. So chatting on Tazel is a great way and very effective way to learn more, but feel free to also share the info you are going to learn today on social media using the Phys Ed Summit hashtag so all educators can see it. At the end of the presentation, I will also be uh, putting out a Flipgrid link on Tazel. We are trying Flipgrid this year as a new way to do video reflection of up to 90 seconds and share what you learned and how you might use this information in your own classes. If you post a Flipgrid, you will be entered to win one of two subscriptions for a premium version for Flipgrid for one full calendar year. Shout out to Flipgrid for helping us out with that. Uh, certificates of participation are available on our website. Uh, so you can also uh, get that access to that on our website after the uh, presentation is complete. I would like to introduce our uh, presenter today. And uh, this is the first of two back-to-back -back sessions that we are going to be doing together. So uh, Lisa Berman is from St. Louis, and she is from the Soulard School in St. Louis. And her presentation today is on uh, the Paralympic unit at her school during the 2016 Paralympic Games that were going on in Rio. So I'm going to turn it over to her and let her introduce herself and talk a little bit about today's presentation. Lisa? All right. Well, hi. Um, I thought it would be good to explain a little bit about my teaching situation to give you some um, context for this unit. And so I think the first thing I always tell people is that, um, well, I teach K to 5. I teach in a very small school. So I have one class per grade, and I only see them one hour a week. Um, my school also does not have a gym. So I have to, and I, I have an, for an hour, but that also includes time uh, to walk across the street with the class to the gym that we whose space we use that's across the street from our school it's a boys and girls club and since nobody's there during the day because it's an after school program i use their space um, and it's a beautiful nice large gym uh, they, they have a lot of traditional equipment i tend to use a lot of less traditional equipment like pool noodles and, and all the things that you use but um you know so they have basic sports equipment um, but i tend to use um, other equipment. So every class I do, every week, I've got to load up my car, everything's stored in my basement, I bring it to the gym. Um, if it's a lot of stuff, I do have a space there that I can store items, but usually I tend to load in and load out um, each day that I teach. Um, this is my fifth year, and when I first got to the school, this is, um, I'm going to give you some context for how I came to decide to, to do this Paralympic unit. So the first year I got to the school, um, it seemed like the entirety of the curriculum had been um, tag, dodgeball, and two-ball soccer. So um, I had a, I was coming in wanting to use the national standards, the shape standards, and from the kids who, who were in the upper grades, I got a lot of pushback. Literally every day I arrived at their door for PE, they would say, can we play two-ball soccer today? And I would say, and so eventually we had to have a lot of discussions about why we have PE. Um, and, you know, and we're going to do jump rope. We're going to, you know, learn how to catch and throw. We're going to build up our racket skills. So, um, and then I found that the kids really, in any kind of game situation, would give up pretty quickly. So if it just happened to be that two teams were playing each other and a team was down by one point, and this could be something like balloon volleyball, um, if their team was down by even just one point, three kids would just walk away and sit down. So I started to think, wow, they really need to understand 
the joy that comes from a challenge. And, and we were talking about, well, how's that team going to do without you? Now it's going to be even harder to get that point. And, um, so that's how my first year went. Um, and then when I came back the second year, I used that facing challenge as the platform for my entire year, still learning the same um, standards that we were going to learn, but using that as um, the, the constant conversation that we were having. So um, I also felt like maybe their skills were so lacking that we started with very basic things like run, jump, throw was a curriculum that I used to really say like, this is how you run efficiently. This is how you, this is, you know, the TL stuff throw. These were um, phrases they had never learned before. So um, fast forward a couple of years, um, they were really doing well. I, they weren't coming in. I also had those kids that were coming in and say like, you know, my pinky really hurts today. I don't think I'll be able to throw very well. Or I, I hurt my ankle at soccer practice. I can't run. And my answer to them had always been, I could find ways for anybody to be active in our class. Let's see how we can, you know, include you in this game and still, you know, make sure that your pinky doesn't hurt or make sure that your ankle doesn't hurt. And so having had those constant conversations, then I got to last year and the um, Rio Olympics were going to be starting right around the same time as school. And I said, what a great way to be able to, um, to really jump on that topic and really hit home that anybody can be active. So, um, so that's where the concept for this uh, unit came from. And I just knew that I wanted to start. So um, we can go to the, so there's the first slide. You can see some um, pictures. Um, so and when you're ready, you can put up the first slide. So what I'm really hoping will okay, work well do. during this presentation is I, I also started using Seesaw this year. So last year, one of my goals was to include more technology, use technology more in PE. Um, and so it was um, through the use of Seesaw and then also um, I eventually bought a projector set up for, for, that I could bring in and out of the gym. Um, so I, by using Seesaw, um, which obviously could be a whole Phys Ed Summit uh, talk in itself, I really was able to gather a lot of video and photos this year. So, um, so you're going to see these are some, some of the photos. Um, and I'm hoping that the videos will work because that will really show the kids in action and give you a taste of what this unit was like. So, um, all right, so we can go to the next slide. So, again, just to reiterate why Paralympics, um, it was a current event, so it tied into something that was actually going on. Um, I had been using a spacing challenge as an overriding theme. Um, I wanted to help them kind of develop a little bit of grit is a popular term that people use now. Like, you know, sometimes things are hard, but we just have to persevere. And I thought it was a great way. I really love to teach, um, especially for, in, for differentiation. I think it's great to, um, <laughs> I think it's really great to just introduce something that nobody's ever done before. And that's a great way to challenge kids who need to work on their basic skills, but also kids who are ready to use their skills in a new way. So I felt the same way. I used to be a classroom teacher and I introduced a program where everybody in our middle school learn Shakespeare and perform Shakespeare because I felt it was a similar idea. It challenged the kids who really were ready for a challenge, but um, helped kids learn, kids learn basic skills too. So, all right, let's go to the next slide. Um, so my objectives for you today is that by the end of this session, um, you'll be able to, I, I included as many resources as I could in the um, TOSL page. Um, you know, uh, my whole lesson plan is there, so you could try and recreate it, or you could use that as a platform for um, looking at your school, your equipment, your environment, and creating your own lessons. Um, and then, you know, how might you take, um, look at maybe the curriculum that you already have. Like this year, I'm hoping to continue um, to, for each unit I teach, how can I keep that idea in like, should I keep blindfolds kind of at the ready for an, for an activity? Or already I had a kid come in with, um, she had stitches in her foot because she cut her foot talking about how she could participate. And um, so I think it's really, it's, we can think about this. I, I don't have any kind of experience. I never took any courses in adapted PE, but it's really uh, taught me a lot just teaching this unit and helped me think about even more ways to, to help students learn that everybody can be active. So, all right, let's go to the next slide. 
Um, so, like I said, I don't have um, a lot, I didn't have a lot of background in adaptive PE. So what I did was I just really started with the Paralympics and went, did a lot of searches on YouTube. They're really great videos that are um, on YouTube from the Paralympic Olympic uh, Committee. And so you'll see some of those links uh, in the TASL page. I just did as much reading as I can. Curriculum development has always been a passion of mine. So I love somebody just give me a new topic and I love to do the research to find really great resources, get a lot of background. And then there were also the supplies. So I didn't have a lot of supplies for um, adaptive, adaptive sports. So just learning what's out there and what would the, what would, um, was there a difference in what, what you might buy for an adaptive PE class versus a typical PE class. So, if, and if you didn't have a blended class, so um, just, looking at a lot of different websites for their equipment. Uh, my budget for the year is $100. So I can tell you that I did actually spend quite a bit of my own money to get some of the resources, especially when it came to the end and um, wrenching wheelchairs. Um, but I, I see teaching as my hobby. <laughs> Maybe you might be more resourceful um, than I was. You might be able to have some of these supplies in your closets already. Um, but I'll, I'll let you know kind of where I got the supplies and. Um, I can't remember the exact websites for some things, but I'll explain as we look at the slides what I got, what I purchased and what I already had um, to help you understand what I use. And then you could think of adapting it like um, with your own equipment. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so how did I decide what to teach? So the Paralympics, there are many different Paralympic sports. But I, again, I, I, so I went through the full list to try and find out exactly what all the, the summer Paralympic sports were. And then what I definitely couldn't do, like swimming, because I wouldn't have a pool. Um, and, uh, but then trying to just really kind of be open to what could I incorporate. And so that was part of my research. I looked at my own equipment. Um, I looked at what standards I was hoping to cover during the beginning of the year. And then, with that information came up with a logical progression for the unit. Um, again, the previous year or a couple of years previously, I had start with that run, jump, throw uh, curriculum. So I decided to cover track and field events first as um, a blind athlete would participate. That seemed to be a good, um, a good way to start because they can all run, jump, and throw. And this was just adding something a little different, but also would uh, Blind athletes often have assistance, so I was also encouraging the kids to work together. Something I was concerned about was that many of the sports that we I chose to include would involve the kids sitting, and so I made sure that their instant activities when they came in the gym each day were of, of a high um, MVPA nature, so that I knew that at least they were getting their heart rates up. Maybe not for the whole half of the class, that's our goal, but um, at least a good portion of, of the first half of the class. Um, you should know about the resources that are on the TASL page. I, I actually, at this point in the year, didn't have a way to show video, but some of those videos I would send to their classroom teachers. All of our, all of our rooms do have Apple TV and projectors. Um, so I was able to send them a video and say, hey, it'd be really cool if the class could watch this video sometime before the next PE class. And they could usually work in a three or four minute YouTube video just to give the kids some background. Um, so even if you don't have video in your class, you can still try and work with your classroom teachers. Um, and then I encourage the kids to, to go home and try and find the uh, Paralympics on TV. Um, it wasn't necessarily, um, the, I don't know if you remember, right before the, um, the Paralympics started, there was all this news coverage about how they didn't have enough funding for as much TV coverage as they were supposed to. I guess the games had lost some money or not made as much money. So that was really disappointing because that meant it was going to be harder to see it. So, um, but kids did report seeing some of the sports that we had um, we had been talking about. So that was that was a neat tie-in. All right. Okay. So we started out with um, just to give them an uh, an experience that was in the classroom. I bought balls that had bells in them because of a unique sport to um, to the Paralympics is a game called goalball and involves um, players wearing blindfolds 
even if they're have some sight, everybody wears blindfolds, just make sure nobody can see. And then they um, hurl these balls towards a net and they have to try and stop the ball. So um, I thought this would be a good beginning activity. So um, they just did, they started without the, they got to play with the balls and shake them because everybody wants to do that. And then um, I had them sitting on the floor, as you can see, rolling the balls back and forth. And then they put on blindfolds and tried it and to see how that would go. Um, with the younger grades, I never made anybody, especially kindergarten, first, second grade, I didn't make them put on a blindfold. I let it be an option. I, well, I would never make the older kids either, but they were fine with it. But I didn't want to, especially these kindergartners who barely knew me, um, I didn't want to be like, now you can't see. <laughs> so um, you have to be sensitive to what the kids are ready for. So I gave it, it I let it be an option for them. So um, let's play the first video. It would be the one kind of on the bottom left. Where they're sitting in a, they're sitting down. Sorry, I had to unmute my microphone for that. <laughs> so I'm going to go back to the presentation. And you said the bottom left one. Yes. Okay, I'm I'm going to pull up my headphones here, and so we can play this video. If it's too loud, let me know. So it's a really simple activity. Just give them some familiarity with what does it feel like to do an activity I've done before, um, but not be able to see. And then we talked about it afterwards. And they thought it was fun. They thought it was fun and different. Then with the older kids in the in the bigger video, um, there are these are they were third graders at the time. So um, there they have a sighted helper, and the two blind athletes are having a catch. So their goal is to try and like shake it. So the person knows where it's where it is, and then give a toss and see if they can if they can catch it. So you can play that video. And so the, they felt really good, you know, that felt really good to not only catch a ball, but to catch a ball when you were blindfolded. So I think they were really starting, um, they said, again, reported a lot of enjoyment. Um, something you might ask as we go through the unit is, um, this year my goal is better assessment. So um, Seesaw really, and I was um, watching the end of Mike's um, session on gamification, and this idea that it's small steps. So for me to just have all this video I could refer back to last year, what to say, you know, can so and so really the, do they do the TL stuff throw when they throw, for instance? Um, just to be able to go back to a class's video and really see their jump roping skills, that was my first real um, improvement in documentation. This year, I'm hoping to incorporate more assessment. So, again, this year, it, there was really just the, this video assessment and my conversations with the kids. So, all right, let's go to the next slide. Okay. All right, so then we went outside. They had this experience being blind athletes, and then we were doing the running. So I explained to them how, so they did some running, jumping, um, and throwing as their warm up without blindfolds, um, running back and forth across the field. We talked about running technique. Um, and then once they had um, observed each other running, doing their throwing, then we learned how do blind athletes participate in these sports. So in, in running for track and field, blind athletes do have a sighted guide. One of the rules is that their guide can't cross the finish line before they do. So this was, these two videos are showing them practicing these skills. And we talked about, you know, it's not your job to drag the, the blind athlete. You're, the, the sighted guide is really just making sure that the athlete goes in a straight line, um, but it's, they're the athlete. So you are their assistant. And so this was how that got implemented in class. Which one do you want me to play first, Lisa? I'm sorry, say it again? Which one would you like me to play first? All right, you can just kind of go across like you're reading. Okay. Dog. Oh, 
okay. And so that was just basic running across the field. And then let's go to the next slide. Okay. Let's see. And so we do have that, that big field in the back, but even I think on this day, we stayed inside. It was raining. I can't remember why, but this is um, some second graders. Oh, no, th these are first graders who were doing um, the same activity in the gym. A pretty short video. Oh, so that was, that's a real, so I tried not to put too long of videos in here, but um, that one's pretty short, so I'm not sure how that came through. I can play you want me to? Uh, you can play it again. Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so long jump is really interesting. So this was really challenging. These are third graders. And what happens in long jump is that the athlete gets set up at the end of the run. And their assistant, their sighted assistant, is at the line where they jump. And they have to, um, they have a series of like, a lot of times what you'll see is the sighted guide will do like a slow clap. And then as they get closer, they clap faster so that the athlete knows what they're getting. And then they have a signal where, when it's time to jump. And so and I'm sure with the hours of practice, they have a really good connection and rhythm. So that was their assignment. They were put into pairs. Um, the athlete would run towards the sighted guide and it was their goal to see if they could get their athlete to jump at the right time to not jump after they got to the line. So here's, actually my son is the, the guy in black and this is his, his buddy helping him. <laughs> and I wish I had included one of the videos where it didn't work at all. You know, where the person runs and they just keep running past the line or they, you know, they jump and then they take off the blindfold and they haven't even gotten to the line. So there was a lot of that. and. Um, and but they would just keep going back over and over. They liked the the challenge, and then of course they would switch to see um, so that they could so everybody got a chance to try this. And then I think we have one more track and field event. This is the shot put. So the way shot put works is the um, the sighted guide walks their athlete to the place where they will do their throwing, kind of gets them pointed in the right direction, and then gets out of the way. So that they don't get um, hit by the arm that comes back for the throw. And so you can see Caden in the front there in blue, beautiful TL step throw position. And, and then they would run and then they would throw. And they could see how far they threw the ball. So I think those are all, all of our track and field events. Does anybody have any questions about that section of the unit? I'm not sure if anyone has any questions, Lisa. I would have to. Okay. Check the tazzle, which I don't have up right now. I know Sarah Gitchy Hartman actually is on the tazzle, so maybe um, she could chime in if there is are some questions, and we can go back to the uh, these slides if they're relevant. Yeah, I know, uh, I do see a note that says the videos are small because we're not putting them in full screen. So maybe when you play one, if you could hit the full screen. Um, we have a uh, the. I, the link to the um, to the slides is in the tazzle, but the issue we were having is that apparently my my uh, drive doesn't give anybody permission. Even though I share the the slides, it still requests additional per, uh, permission to see videos on the slide. So, um, so from here on out, we could try expanding the video. The I'll, I'll give it a try when we get to our our next. Uh, yeah. Slide. All right, so another sport that um, I thought they could try that, again, I don't have enough nets for everybody, but I have lots of folding chairs. So, so I set up these folding chairs in the middle. Those were the nets. Um, I told them, and if you watch the videos for seated volleyball, those athletes move around a lot on the floor. Their bottoms have to stay on the ground um, while they're playing, but they really move a lot. And so I think it's a really neat video to be able to show the kids of the players. My kids rear ends were definitely glued to the ground. Like, I mean, it was just too quick a game. And so to, for them to be able to connect, hey, this, that's amazing how these athletes can really move around the floor, um, what the reaction time is, how, how quick it is, and that they had a pretty challenging time moving it all. Like just keeping the ball in play was a challenge for them. So, and, we, and so our day might have started, I think, I'm pretty sure it started with just some 
volleyball skill warm up. Now we will do a we would go on to do later in the year a a more extended unit on striking and volleying. But these are in this uh, video. These are again I think this is a pretty quick one. So um, it was hard to get good video because the volleys were not very fast, very long. Um, but these are fourth and fifth graders. Okay, and I'll see if I can go big uh, full screen, but I'm not sure if it's going to let me. We'll see. Looks like I can. It's only a two second video, so I will. I'll play it again. Yeah. <laughs> that was about the extent of the volley. If they got three hits, it was pretty impressive. Okay. So now, definitely this year, when we do our striking and volley unit, we will include seated volleyball again as a variation. Um, this was, I think, just about everybody's favorite part of the unit um, because it was there were so many different options. So this is probably where I put in the most funds, I would say. Um, I didn't have any indoor bocce sets. You can use just bean bags for bocce, but um, I really wanted to get actual bocce sets. But I also bought these koosh ball bocce sets. I bought these rubbery indoor bocce sets, and I bought one actual real bocce set, which is the Paralympic version of the sport. So um, if you've never played, bocce is a long game, but bocha in the Olympics is played indoors. And um, so that's why I wanted us all to be playing indoors, which is why I needed indoor uh, bocce sets. So um, the kids were put into teams to play this game. There's a jack ball, you toss out the jack ball, people take turns um, throwing their balls, whoever's, whichever team's balls come closest to the jack ball, they, um, they get a point and you play for a few rounds. So, um, so this is uh, this is the typical version of bocce. So you can play the video. Okay, and uh, then we do have a question about track and field. Uh, after okay. we talk about bocce here. Oops. That was my best reaction. I felt like that. Means. All right, so then, so that was happening at one end of the gym. And then at the other end of the gym was the Paralympic version. So in the Paralympic version, uh, most of the athletes are in wheelchairs, which is why all the kids are sitting in chairs. And they can either throw, kick, roll, or some of them use a ramp to send the ball. So, and they have, they have a, if they even need it, they have a guide that will position the ramp, but the guide cannot look at the balls. So the guide actually, we didn't do this part, but the guide will actually face away from the playing area and just follow the directions of their athlete to place the ramp. Um, it was, I wanted a kind of ramp where the ball couldn't fall off the ramp and I was trying to find cheap ways to do that. So those tubes I got at Home Depot and I think they were like a dollar or two each. So it was a really good solution. And there's these big cardboard tubes. And so um, during a, a one, for every round of play, one person was, was allowed to use the tube. And then for every round of play, the tube kind of moved to the different players so that they could all have a turn with that because everybody wanted to use the tube. I thought it was a good physics, physics lesson too, actually. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. I don't, I don't know if I have a video of this one. Maybe on the next week. Nope. So no video of that. I really thought I had. So. Um, all right, so what happened, this says culminating event. When we did this day in PE, I didn't know it was our culminating event. I had been organizing a trip to the, um, to the, the Missouri School for the Blind. It's only about three blocks from my house. And so I had been, I had called a few times about a field trip there where we were going to ride their bikes and play goalball and do, um, a, and take a tour of the school. Um, and that didn't quite pan out. So, and I'll explain a little later um, kind of how that, why we didn't go do that. But um, so what I did was, what was really important to me is I really wanted to give them a chance to use wheelchairs. And I called everybody under the sun trying to get some free wheelchairs for a week for PE. And just, I, I don't live far from Children's Hospital. I even briefly entertained the idea of just going to take some from the parking lot, but that wasn't right. So I, in the end, I had to rent the wheelchairs. And so, um, and I probably, if I had planned better, maybe my parents association might have volunteered to pay for that or, um, but so 
if you want wheelchairs and PE, plan way far in advance, is my advice to you. Um, so, but so in that case, I only had two wheelchairs. And so that's not, uh, so I needed stations. So we did stations. So this is five aside soccer. In five aside soccer, the players are um, on the team, four of the athletes are blind, and then the goalie can see. And so that's how five aside soccer is played. So this is actually the, the boys and girls club has a dodgeball court, and we never use it for dodgeball because that's not quality PE, in my opinion. But it does make a nice enclosed space for other activities like this. So this was our five-a-side soccer field. And so they were working with the teacher. This was also kind of hard. Nobody got hurt. Everybody moved really well in the space. But it was hard to get good video that didn't just look like a mob of people following the ball with the bells. But it, I, they really um, got a lot out of that experience. So this, I, I don't have a video. I just have a photo of that. We can go to the next slide. Um, and then also I wanted to not just be about think like, oh, well, the Summer Olympics in Rio are going on now and then it ends. So there's all kinds of there's Winter Olympics, there's the Special Olympics. Um, and so I learned that um, golf was a deaf Olympic sport or deaf Olympics. So I set up this little golf, mini golf station and they were supposed to actually not talk to each other and try and communicate whose turn it was and um, what their score was without talking. but because I was circulating around the room, uh, that didn't really help. So I'll just say, you might have, if you would like to try that, you have to think of a way to get them to really, I didn't have them, you know, like we use blindfolds for the wide sports, I didn't like keep their mouth shut or anything. So, um, so that didn't really work as well as I had hoped, but that was the idea behind that station. I still gave them their golfing, a little bit of a golfing practice. So in the Winter Olympics, there's sledge hockey. So I got these little hockey sticks at the store um, that you can find with their scooter. You, some of you might have scooter hockey sets, but you could call it sledge hockey because that's basically what it looks like um, in the Paralympics. So um, I just had a one-on-one -on -one game with our goals that were in the gym. And they they were supposed to try and use, because they do this in sledge hockey, use the ends of the hockey sticks as to kind of push themselves along. So, all right, next slide. Um, so you'll see, I encourage everybody to watch the archery video that's in the tassel. So the world's best archer doesn't have arms. He uses his feet. And so I bought these little archery sets. I think I found them in a few places. I found some at Toys R Us. And if you've ever been on the site, Zoo Lily, uh, Zoo Lily was having, had some that were on sale. So I bought four of these kitty suction cup volleyball sets, uh, I mean, archery sets. And they work pretty well, actually. And everybody really loved it. And I, absolutely told them that they could try and do it with their feet but nobody it was challenging enough just to do archery um <laughs> so they're in the wheelchair there's again they're sitting in chairs because he, he sits in a chair when he does archery and um but some stood up and um and they loved the station and i said oh it seemed like everybody really loved it we'll do it again this year and i never really had a chance to pull them out again that's my biggest challenge with my classes is that they like an activity and they want to do it again and i say but I only see you, you know, 40 times a year, so I've got to cover a lot, and so it's hard to to do activities twice, really. So, all right, next. And then the highlight of the day was the the wheelchair basketball. So I was able, I got because I have some bigger kids and smaller kids, I got a really small wheelchair that was really good for like K1, 2 size, but most of my even fourth and fifth graders could squeeze into it, and then a, a little slightly larger kids wheelchair and set up these are like those can jam games those were their baskets they're also regular height baskets around the gym so they could shoot wherever they wanted to but most chose to just try and wheel around and uh and throw a basket for their balls and knees so all right next slide and this is a video again this is my son again and i don't know if anybody else uses seesaw but the beauty of seesaw is sometimes not what the person in the video is doing but what's going on behind them and so uh, you can also watch the girl behind your behind him because that's amusing too. Go back that way. Um, so, because 
because they're, you know, 20 kids in a class and we're only there for an hour, everybody only got five minutes of wheelchair time. And that's how I got everybody to the all the stations by the end of the day and everybody got a turn with the wheelchair, um, with the wheelchairs. So, um, all right, so I was really excited about trying goalball at the beginning of this unit. That's what we started with. But because the field trip didn't work out and I was feeling a little bit of pressure to move on to our next unit because of time, because I don't see my kids more than once a week, um, we actually never got to play goalball, which was a big disappointment for me. I thought playing goalball on a goalball court with real goalball equipment was really going to be our culminating event. But then it seemed kind of odd to go back to that after we had, had the wheelchairs seem like so big and exciting to everybody. So we actually never, we can hit um, enter on the slide, my little like sad about <laughs> goalball emoji. So maybe this year, um, it was just, they had a new outreach person. So I, I tried to get in touch with the outreach person and that person was in the process of being hired. And then I called the PE teacher and he was really encouraging, welcoming. He said, but I have to go through the outreach coordinator. And then it just never seemed to pan out. And you, you know, you can't, you know, I'm sure you've been in the situation. You can't really call anybody too many times because then you feel like, um, that, you know, you're being a pest. So no goalball, maybe this year. So a quick question, Lisa, uh, did you have a, um, this is a question from Tazel. Did you have a culminating event for track and field or any type of competition for track and field? Um, we didn't. So another way that you could do a culminating event would be to have your own Paralympics would be a great event. I felt like I do actually have a co-teacher and assistant, um, but still just the two of us, that seemed too big a challenge to take on i mean i and it felt since my kids do shy away from competition i didn't want that to be the, what the takeaway that like oh i was i i don't think competition is a bad thing but it felt like for the end of this unit i really wanted them to be open-minded and that maybe a competition for my students and their mindset at this point in the year was not going to be a good way to end the unit for them Okay, thanks. Other than that, I don't think there were any other questions on Tazel. Okay, well, that's that's the unit. So, like I said, my lesson plans are there. Um, some really great resource videos for people to watch. And if you have any questions, please let me know. I'd love to hear, you know, if other people use this idea and what they do with it. And then maybe I can learn from them and their their successes. For sure, for sure. Yeah, so thank you so much, Lisa, for sharing. Uh, that was really fascinating. I did, uh, when I was teaching middle school, um, several years ago, uh, when the Winter Olympics were in uh, Sochi, I did a Winter Olympics unit, not a Paralympics one, but just an Olympics one that was really, um, you know, kind of eye-opening for the kids just because of the non-traditional nature of it, which was a lot of fun. And being able to kind of learn a lot about the culture and, and sports that we were learning, it was, it was a lot of fun. Okay. Well, that's it. Okay. So, um, thanks everyone for watching. I'm going to post a the link again to the Flipgrid and if you could take a minute or two to um, try out Flipgrid and give us your little reflection on, um, on what you learned today and how you might use it in your classroom, uh, you can leave up to 90 seconds of video. Um, it's a great way for us to kind of keep the conversation going here. And uh, again, anyone who chooses to leave a Flipgrid will be entered into a drawing to be able to uh, I get two, we have two full year calendar year subscriptions for uh, Flipgrid, the premium Flipgrid, and uh, and we're, we're looking forward to giving those out. So thanks to Flipgrid. Uh, again, I want to thank you for attending and thank you for watching uh, this session of the Phys Ed Summit. Uh, Lee and I will be back in probably about 15 minutes because we have our second session uh, with parkour. So I hope you choose to uh, join us there. And uh, thanks for thanks for watching. Any final words, Lisa? Uh, no, thank you. I also put it in the tazel. Thanks to everybody. Awesome. Cool. Well, we'll be back in about 15 minutes. And uh, thanks again, everybody, for watching.